You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hi, I'm Will, and today I'm joined by Lewis Jeffries to learn all about the art of underwater filmmaking and photography. Thanks for joining me today, Lewis. Thanks for having me, Will. So we'll start we'll start off the podcast with a uh, memorable with a random ocean question which we do with all our podcasts. Um and your question is what is your most memorable marine life encounter? I mean there's been lots of memorable encounters but probably the one that sticks out the most um is uh probably the first time I swam with a whale shark. Uh, I was out in the Maldives actually. I was out there doing um an independent self self-produced film. Um for my third year of study actually in marine and natural history photography. And uh, yeah, spent a month out there with the Maldives Whale Shark Research Programme, who are an amazing organisation doing great conservation work out there. Very lucky to spend time out there with them. But uh, but yeah, it's kind of in the first week with them, really. And we're out uh, on the boat, a traditional Maldivian boat, searching for whale sharks each day. And um, just keep an eye out for large, dark shadows, really, and um, <laughs> like fins sticking out the water. Right. And uh, yeah, we're out there for about four days looking and we, we didn't see a shark and uh, spirits were starting to get a bit low that we might not see one for a long time. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, the captain of the boat gets a call and uh, from one of his friends and yeah, they tracked down a whale shark uh, a little, little while away. And uh, yeah, so we turn around heading that direction. And fortunately, the whale shark was still there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just like couldn't wait to get in the water and uh yeah got in there and it just completely blew my mind basically i knew it was going to be amazing but uh just like how beautiful they are the, the spotted patterns of the shark and uh and just its size as well it's about a nine meter shark i think we saw right and uh right. So just absolutely amazing and they almost don't look like real creatures because they're just so perfect it's just yeah. like a wonder suppose, really yeah and i suppose you obviously see so many pictures of them i guess in the past to actually see one in person is must yeah. be quite a sort of weird experience after seeing seeing the videos and photos. Really, yeah, yeah, and just so graceful and uh, and swimming so slowly, so chilled as well. As long yeah. as you keep your distance from them, don't obstruct obstruct the shark and stuff like that. You know, um, yeah, just an amazing encounter. Really, wow. it's great. Yeah. I'm sure you've probably got plenty of other ones like that that we'll probably hear about soon. Um, but should we start a bit about your background? So obviously, being an on sort of a filmmaker that does a lot of stuff underwater isn't sort of a run of the mill sort of job is very unique so do you want to tell us a bit sort of how you got into it was it always something that you wanted to do or was it something that happened a bit later on in life I mean it did happen as a profession later on in life uh kind of got into it kind of um long-winded way really um sort of taking it right back um basically both of my parents were never very confident in the water and actually both had like a fear of the sea right. and uh, they never wanted uh, that for me. So they, they sort of thought, right, we're going to get him in the water as soon as possible. We don't want him to have that, that fear. So, you know, as soon as I was old enough, I was doing swimming lessons and, and this and that. And then um, basically as soon as I was old enough to scuba dive, they decided that they were going to put me through my patio water course. Right. I was only 13 years old. And uh, yeah, fortunately, like a, a kid that lived over the road from me, his his parents uh, were super keen to get him on the course as well. And uh, yeah, so we both did it just 13. And um, yeah, it was great. Sort of learnt scuba dive off our local docks down in, in Exmouth in Devon. Right. And um, I wasn't really into photography at all before that either, actually. And uh, so funnily enough, I actually got into underwater photography before I got into standard land-based photography. Right. Um, cause like part of the advanced open water course, you're allowed to choose like specialisms. And one of those was underwater photography. And, uh, so we used a, a compact, like instant film underwater camera and took our pictures on that. And I just remember taking a few pictures of, um, like Blennies under the docks and things like that. Right. And, uh, just couldn't wait to show like my family and stuff that hadn't seen those things before. And, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, the love of photography and underwater photography, especially kind of developed in those yeah. early few years, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I actually sort of took a completely different career path. Funnily enough, I was actually a car mechanic for like 10 years okay. before I got into it. Yeah. Which is totally different. Uh, basically my dad kind of got me into, uh, you know, the kind of trade side of things and yeah. just, you know, had, had to sort of earn money and get a stable job um because yeah. obviously underwater filmmaking photography is not a stable job <laughs> at all <laughs> but uh but yeah so I did that for about 10 years and um 
as time went on, sort of lost any kind of love and passion for cars totally. And uh, sort of my, my passion for photography and diving kind of grew really. But uh, so I was, I was looking around for um, kind of a university course to kind of change direction. Because um, actually early on in life wasn't, I decided it wasn't the right time for uni at that stage in my life, you know, coming out of school at like 18, 19, I didn't really yeah. know exactly what course I wanted to do and stuff like that kind of developed that, um, throughout later in life really. But, um, anyway, found, um, a really amazing course at Falmouth university called Marina natural history photography. Right. Um, and it kind of summed up like all of my passions and interests in one course really. And, uh, I don't think if I had, if I hadn't found that course, I don't think I would have gone to university right. actually. Um, cause I hadn't really had the, although I had an interest in marine biology and things like that. And a career in marine biology would have been amazing. I don't think I had like kind of the, 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 um qualifications to kind of get yeah. onto a marine biology course but the uh the course that i chose was a very um kind of specialist course really and more kind of artistic so you didn't really have to have like science qualifications or stuff yeah. to get onto it yeah i was, I was um, gonna say like it obviously is quite a specialist subject and was it was it hard to find like that course or was it something that was you know fairly well advertised because i imagine it's quite something that only a few people would 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 do not sort of a the kind of course you think oh yeah if i'm gonna to go to uni i'm gonna do that it's obviously very yeah. specialist yeah um i mean if you sort of search for yeah underwater photography courses yeah. or yeah like careers in diving underwater filmmaking wildlife filmmaking that sort of thing it's pretty high up the list yeah um and yeah at one point i think there's a few more courses that have taken after it now and have maybe right. gained a bit of inspiration from it but certainly at the time it was one of the only courses in the world that was actually right. offering that kind of um tuition okay. and that kind of like foundation in wildlife filmmaking with um with a module in underwater photography yeah. as well and uh and anyway the, the the equipment that they offered there and that they have at the stores was just sort of second to none i think they had about three three million pounds worth of camera equipment including underwater yeah. stuff that you could get you know get hold of and use which was you know amazing and and that's kind of one of the barriers of getting in as well as having access to the kind of kit that you need to use to be able to produce like high quality images and stuff it's yeah none of it's cheap um and yeah having you know three years to play with lots of kit um that you can't afford is, is yeah. priceless really as well as have the expert tuition from you know lecturers in the field yeah. and stuff like that as well it was great yeah so yeah, so that's, talk, that's talk a kind about, of winded way of uh <laughs> of how i got into it yeah. i was gonna say talking about equipment so i'd love to sort of know the process of kind of going on one of these say jobs that you have you know when you say someone comes to you and say you know we need this filmed or, or photographed underwater what is the process that you have to go through to be able to sort of make that happen so what things do you need to consider when you're planning a project what kind of risks you have to think about yeah yeah definitely there's there's a lot involved and uh it's quite a long process at times um and yeah starts from the very sort of basics really um i mean maybe to give like an expedition uh, sort of example so there'd be se sort of like a scientific expedition going on maybe and they might need a filmmaker or photographer to join that trip so you'd um you join that uh stage of discussion in the early processes and you'd um you know make sure you have all the necessarily qualifications and um you know first aid and all that kind of thing yeah. um in place um and then yeah you kind of really your work's kind of secondary to what the scientific work that's going on yeah. but ultimately you need that image and you need that image to be powerful so you have to kind of um, make sure that you're integrated in everything they're doing throughout um to yeah make sure you take those images away really from the trip um but but yeah i mean weather is always a big issue as well yeah. especially in the uk i do most of my work in the uk um and yeah so it's really difficult to plan um diving trips in advance um because yeah the sea conditions are so sporadic um yeah you're either lucky or you're not basically <laughs> usually um and yeah cancellations are quite frequent so you have to be very flexible um you know with date changes and things like that as well um but yeah also if you're you know if you want to shoot a specific species of wildlife as well that can be very tricky um you know you can know where it lives and you can have a rough idea of what it might do but like 
nine times out of ten probably go to the location on the day and it's not around or yeah. you know it's, it's was, not doing the yeah, thing was, that you want it to do i was going to say you're not only dealing with logistics you're dealing with working with animals as well which is yeah. obviously never easy but how hard is it to sort of take that perfect photo and I, the kind of question I have is like do you know when you've taken the perfect photo or is it you're taking a lot of photos and then seeing what comes from it afterwards or do you know when you've got that photo you think yeah that's that's the one um there's a certain element of like knowing that you've got the shot but certainly do take an awful lot of images and then you sort through your images and and you choose the you know the perfect one out of that so yeah i would say um you know nine out of ten photographers probably do like yeah. overshoot make sure that when you're there you're like shooting lots and lots of images yeah you've obviously got a creative idea in your head about like the kind of shot that you want to create um before and it's good to go into a situation with with that kind of knowledge in your head already of what, what you'd like to create and then you know you use all the conditions and the way that the animal's behaving on the day to to the way that you'd like to make the shot yeah. work really but yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Say, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, obviously, you said you do a lot of your work in the UK. Obviously, you mentioned with the, with the shark story, but it's in the Maldives as well. What is the kind of favourite place you've been to to, to for the work? Yeah. Um, the Maldives is definitely up there. But yeah. um, that was, again, like I say, that was a self funded project, a right. university project. So right. that's probably the only one that I've been abroad to film actually like all of my um kind of like professional jobs have been in the yeah. UK but like probably a standout one well there's probably two standouts actually one of them was with uh, Project Seagrass and Harriet Watt University I'm right. um, on a seagrass expedition up in the Orkney Isles last summer yeah yeah so I was commissioned as uh, the expedition photographer and filmmaker to travel up there and we lived on a liverboard boat for a week and uh, oh, just right. explored like um lesser known seagrass beds up there basically and uh, the team were researching the meadows and kind of determine the size of the meadows and also the health of the meadows and like what life was living amongst it as well um so that was for um they were researching for carbon stores within um the sediments so they were taking cores uh whilst they were diving and then right. those would be shipped off i think some of them probably ended up at knock actually I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Did. yeah, <laughs> probably, yeah. Cool. Um, and then they, I think some of them went off to another researcher who was looking at, um, the in fauna, the life within them and stuff like that. Um, and then they were taking seagrass samples as well to determine the health of the blades of seagrass right. and things. Um, right. but that was great. The dive team were amazing. Um, and also the team on the boat were great and, you know, it's just a, a really great group of people and yeah, yeah brilliant trip and i mean weather was a real big issue on that trip as well but it didn't kind of like dampen spirits and we were able to get around it because like yeah. we actually we steamed north um for a good few hours actually to quite a re remote location on the first day and we were supposed to spend the whole week in that that location i think it was in the westray isles on the north and uh the first day was absolutely perfect it was like glass calm conditions clear water really really nice and they're able to do everything they wanted to on that first day. And then second day, the tables just turned and it was just undiveable the next day. <laughs> and the captain was like, basically, we've got to head further south because the conditions are just getting worse right. and worse. We could stay here, but I might not be able to get back when we're supposed to be back. <laughs> like it yeah. might not be safe enough to actually make that passage. Right. Um, so he just kind of made a route made the route up, route up as he went along around the eastern side and just went to other meadows and they decided to research those instead of staying in that westray area but they came away with some really good research and some great um carbon samples um, right. not carbon samples cores sorry right so it was, um, yeah, it was a success i think yeah yeah that sounds really cool i think obviously talking about capturing sort of scientist teamwork as well do you do, do you prefer doing the wildlife or is it wildlife compared to sort of scientists that work conservationists like what obviously one is probably harder than the other I imagine the wildlife is harder than doing sort of scientists and them sort of working especially with the seagrass stuff 
Yeah, it can be, definitely. Yeah, I would say capturing wildlife is definitely harder in that you don't know that the animals are going to turn up on the day. And yeah, it's all, you know, right time, right place, yeah. kind of a lot of luck involved. Whereas, you know, working with people in the field, again, you're at the mercy of the conditions, but um, chances are the work is going to be happening. So you can yeah. definitely field it. But I do really like the intersection between people and wildlife. And I definitely. love capturing um, conservationists working in the field, um, you know, to preserve the habitat that they're working in ultimately. And, yeah. uh, and also filming the wildlife that's also in that habitat. So I, I do like telling those stories at the intersection between yeah. the work that's going on and the wildlife that's there. And that's definitely. kind of the space that I work in and sort of specialize in really. So. Yeah. I was going to say, obviously, some of the photos you have captured, especially of wildlife are pretty breathtaking we'll have we'll have links in our description just to, to your portfolio but is there a favorite type of wildlife that you, you've sort of taken photos of in the past is there a favorite obviously you had the, the whale shark but yeah. is there any other sort of type you you sort of had? are I mean, there any ones that are easier than others like are there certain types of animal that are easier to capture than others yeah particular animal that's yeah, easier lends itself well to photography. A jellyfish are good candidates yeah. because they don't tend to move around much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you find a, a nice jellyfish, you can kind of like spend as long as you want around it, just playing with <laughs> the angles and stuff like that. So there's no real excuse not to get decent photos of jellyfish, to be honest. Um, and yeah, but I'd say the animal that I probably enjoy spending time with the most and photographing are grey seals. Right. Um, and we're so lucky to have so many of them in the UK and uh, you can have some amazing experiences with them here, like Lundy Island, especially been there a couple of times now and, and it always produces the goods. It's just amazing. There's like a group of seals there that's so inquisitive and so playful yeah. and uh, you can just guarantee they'll just come to you and just be so inquisitive and yeah, it's really amazing cool. creatures. They're just like underwater dogs, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the photos you're taking that definitely comes across as well. Like they're amazing photos. Oh, great. It's good to hear. Yeah. Um, so obviously the oceans play a pretty big part in your life for most of your life. Have you, have you, have you seen any changes in the ocean over time in terms of sort of how you're interacting with it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, pollution is a big one. Like, yeah, plastic pollution has definitely increased an awful lot is a real shame um that's not to say there's an awful lot going on now to reduce that um and feel like we're at a bit of a turning point now where we might be heading in kind of the right direction there's an awful lot of work to be done still but certainly from i've noticed it from when i was you know a teenager diving up until now like the pollution's increased tenfold yeah. i would say um but also like tourism and, you know, there's good tourism and there's bad tourism. And I think like, yeah, the kind of negative side to tourism has increased a lot. Um, part of me thinks that's probably down to social media in a way. Right. It's like, you know, publicizing these locations and these species and these wildlife encounters a lot. That's not to say social media is a bad thing. It's, it's a really amazing thing if it's used in the right, right way. But um, yeah. But yeah, I think tourism has like overwhelmed certain areas to the point where it's like not sustainable anymore. And, you know, there's a lot of good tour operators, but there's probably equally as many bad ones, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and in some areas it is like totally wrecking coral reefs, you know, how they're anchoring in the wrong yeah. ways, um, how they're like pursuing animals, chasing animals rather than, you know, just letting the animal come to you yeah um there's a very fine balance there sometimes but um i mean there's a lot a lot of awareness about it and a lot of the good operators are doing you know good work to try and spread the message and stuff but yeah it's a complex issue and um i think there's there's a lot of work to be done in that area yeah, really I, I was going to say as well obviously going back to obviously mentioned the seagrass project you worked on if you seen a lot of sort of positive things being done about the ocean yourself with with your own work as well and sort of the, the people you've worked with in the past oh absolutely yeah yeah it's one of the highlights of my job really is getting to work with lots of amazing people that are doing amazing things for the planet and uh yeah that's a kind of really positive thing at the moment as well there seems to be a real momentum for conservation organizations and you know there's there's a lot more awareness about the problems now as well and that 
that goes down to social media again. So that's it can be equally as good as it equally as bad, you know. Um, but like I think the message is is really getting out there, and there's a lot more people who are kind of trying to minimise their impacts on the planet as well, um, which is great. Um, but yeah, sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. But yeah, <laughs> the kind of yeah, there's so many scientists and conservation art. Yeah conservation organizations and NGOs out there that are doing amazing things to kind of turn the tables on the kind of crisis at the moment. Um, and yeah, we just need as many passionate individuals as possible to kind of spread, spread the message. And yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Positive things happening. So should we finish on, on what's next for you? Have you got any other exciting projects coming up? If you sort of tease us for. Yeah, so I'm working on a couple of nice projects at the moment, actually. One is an end of project video for the Life Recreation Remedies Project of Natural right. England. Yeah, so it's um, a seabed conservation focused one that sort of focuses on seagrass and merl beds. And um, so they've been working with recreational boat owners really to minimise their impact on the environment. Um, and that's been going for the last four years. So, um, yeah, we're making an right. end of project video for them to show Kind of what they've achieved and express kind of the legacy of the project and things right. so that's a good one and that's working uh, in partnership with the ocean conservation trust um yeah natural england as well which is a good one um and then there's another project for x to university um and right. that's about blue carbon stores in cornwall which is a seagrass related one as well actually um and it's part of the cornwall nature recovery program by the cornwall council um, and it's kind of the marine area of that, really. So uh, the the people at Exeter University are studying um, kind of the the blue carbon potential of seagrass meadows and uh, the potential of like expanding the seagrass meadows in Cornwall in certain areas, okay. uh, which is good. Yeah, and a bit of lab work as well. Their analysis of the carbon stores cool. um, in the laboratory, which is interesting. Yeah, so yeah, really cool. We're looking forward to seeing the photos and videos in the future. Then oh, cheers. Thank you. <laughs> And um, yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll have links to, to Lewis's full portfolio in, uh, in the description of this episode, just so everyone can check out all the, all the amazing work you've done. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me today, Lewis. Really, really interesting. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Cheers. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.